And so, anyway, this is, you know, this is a short, everybody gets one of these at, on the city council. Mm -hmm. And that's the, yeah, you've seen that. How are you doing? I've seen that. That was loud. I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse that. me? Oh, of course. <laughs> so, and then I just have the, so I'm just doing my background. And so Did you want it in the electric guitar? Or? <laughs> and this is such a perfect time to switch over. So. Yeah, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back. Yeah. Back to back there. And if you want to remain standing, we'll have our invocation by Reverend Peggy Ventress, St. Martin's in the Field Episcopal Church. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will change my heart, my eyes and ears and my hands during this time of pandemic with its isolation, this time of protests against racial inequality, and this time of political unrest. Gentle my heart to daily prayer that addresses the needs of community and country. Gentle my eyes and ears to continually seek and give thanks for the blessings you have already bestowed. Gentle my hands to serve my community with love and justice. Gentle my thinking with the knowledge that you alone, and not any politician, are my king. Thank you for the wisdom for the facing of this hour. Thank you for the courage for the living of these days. Amen. Thank you. Roll call. That's loud. Councilmember Clink. Here. Councilmember Mintz. Here. Councilmember Scott. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bildering. Here. Mayor Wright. Here. All present. Okay, no closed session announcements. Any changes to the agenda? Announcements. These proceedings may be viewed on demand at the City of 29 Palms website at www.29palms.org. You may also live stream this meeting by going on our website and clicking on the meeting agendas link. Awards, presentation, appointments, and proclamations. Uh, introduction of newest uh, city's newest employees. All right, uh, to the city council, I would like to introduce uh, Katrina Bennett, who is our, uh, our newest member of the community development department. She's been with us since November of last year. She's been uh, helping us out with the front counter and uh, help uh, with the overload of the vacation home rental permits. She actually went to high school in 29 Palms. And she has a political science degree from CSUSB, and she's studying a public administration for a master's degree. She's um, quite uh, the fan of, of various arts, reading and music, and did a little bit of acting. And I asked her if she had a, a seven minute uh, stand up routine to tell us. She said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you want to say a few words? Um, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's not quite that shy behind the scenes. <laughs> And next we have a presentation by the Public Arts Advisory Committee. Good evening, council members. Pat Flanagan here. And uh, I think all of you will find that you also have a sheet that's Public Arts Advisory Committee accomplishments since 2009, just so that you don't have to write all that down. 
And um, so, Public Arts Advisory Committee was established September 15, 2004. The founding chair was Chuck Kaplinger, and it now in its 18th year, uh, promoting the arts and artists in 29 Palms. Next. The PAC is a volunteer committee that advises the city on decisions about art in public places. The committee members during my years, myself here, Ann Congdon, Leanne Clark, Wayne Wenicke, Denise Callum, Diane Fox, Keisha Villiers, Anna Stump, Valerie Mead, Chantel Rodriguez, and Cindy Bernard. And Cindy just, I'm sort of like off and Cindy is on like this, but that's, and Vicki Waite has for much of that time been our staff assistant and we give her a lot of credit for things, okay? Our mission, and this is how we operated, is to foster all the arts to the benefit of the entire community. We endeavor to reach all ages and all interests because we believe that art enhances the quality of life for everyone in the community. And so on either side of the mission statement, we have the um, brochure for the Oasis of Murals and other in public art, which is available to the public. And then um, just to show the art crews, which had to stop with COVID and hopefully it will get going again. Okay, next. Um, and it's important um, that I put this in, which are wise words from Craig Watson, who at 2019 was the director of the California Arts Council. And um, he asked, what is the question that local officials ask themselves? How can we attract and retain profitable business and talented people? A key component of such efforts, and one that's often mislabeled amenity, is arts and culture. It's not an amenity, it's dig in, okay? So uh, important to us, back in 2012, and I would recommend that it be done again, we did an artist survey and we looked at um, and sent the survey out, so over Survey Monkey, to artists throughout the Morongo Basin. Next. And the purpose was um, you, the artist, I like to read things. I don't believe you're going to read them, and I'm just going to be quiet, okay? Uh, you, I always get mad when somebody says, now you read it, and I'll be quiet. Uh, <laughs> you, the artist, are important to our Morongo Basin communities. While your inspiration is all around us, we know little about your economic footprint. This survey was developed by the 29 Palms Public Art Advisory Committee to gather your feedback. The more we know about artists, the better we and other local governments and organizations can develop programs that encourage your productivity and benefit our communities. The results of that survey, the survey took 10 minutes to fill out. There were 21 brief questions, two essay questions, and it was shocking to everybody, but we had 100 responses. And um, this is just, you can see the whole survey is online uh, under the pack, but um, we looked at the categories of, of the artists and they went anywhere from painting down to film and as well as theater all different kinds, painting being the most. And there were 98 responses to that, okay? Artists build their own markets. So how many market locally? 81. How many um, uh, other side is 40, 43? And online was 56. And then what you know, you know what? I can't read that up there. So I have to read it here, just a minute. Too small. Um, artists build their own markets, and so up above we have locally, then we have, um, ah, there you go. Go a little bit up to the left. It's, yeah. Outside the local, so our, how they were marketing themselves then was locally, quite, 81 said, you know, quite a lot, 24, outside the local area, and then online. Okay, now the next question. Now we know to the left a little bit. That's to the right. <laughs> I'm ambidextrous. I never get that correct. Um, would you be? Would you like more local retail venues that include art sites? Yes, 82. Yes, and so there. There's a need, but well, we need to go back and ask that question again. Next slide. And Morongo Basin artists may be better known than the Morongo Basin. That's just kidding. Um, 
because the following describes their clientele. So 64 of the 100 artists locally, about 60 some percent, uh, regional 48, 42 did the national, and actually 30 were um, international. So we have artists that are seen all over the place, okay? Summing up, artists live throughout the basin. They are multi-talented, educated, and entrepreneurial. They make money and they spend money. They would like to spend more time locally. They are joiners, supporting each other and their communities. The artists provide many useful ideas to support their work for the betterment of our communities. So it's good having the Public Arts Advisory Committee and um, council members might like to go to a committee once in a while and see what's going on. Okay, next slide. There are now, and this is just page one of six, there are now 240 artists, 45 artists on our registry. So that when we send out information, we get a broad hearing. And 157 of them are women. Next, please. Um, probably until we had uh, COVID coming in, our quarterly art shows in the visitor center were um, very popular and now again are very popular. And at that time, we also, uh, before COVID, we would have a, a little party at the beginning of each one, which brought in, was full. We always had a, a full building. So um, this one, Steve Lambert, has a Google review and talks about how nice the information center was and all that, so next one. Um, our quarterly art shows. Each show has its own theme, and of which there's a rack card, media uh, that can be directly mailed, media is released uh, for both the high and low desert and the opening reception until COVID. So these are three of the cards and the themes. Oh, Those Summer Nights was one theme, birds, bees, and birds, buds, and bees, and another one on the frontier. So you can see how they all get to um, get people to thinking. Okay. The public art inventory, and um, I now we, you own, or, or it's owned, it's public in 29 Palms, there's 70 pieces of public art. And the list is, I'm sure you have that list. Yeah, okay, next one. And here's just a few. So number one, if you've been over to the Historical Society, the sculpture is the Sky Clim Climbers. I had to put in um, the flash flood because I was thinking I might be inundated with one as I go over to Morro Bay. Um, later in the week, but I would really like to see, whoops, back you go, um, sunrises, then we have other ones there, okay. In 2017, the pack covered the remaining costs for the Pioneer Women sculptures installed at the Old Schoolhouse Museum. These sculptures are a chapter of the Oasis Storytelling Project um, on National Park Drive, and there's a number of sculptures there that tell our history and show some background, okay. And then um, when Chuck and I started out, Chuck came before I did, obviously, he started this, but when I got on the pack, we did a lot of research to see how other cities, especially Palm Springs, Palm Desert, et cetera, Yucca Valley had ceased to have a public art um, venue, how they were dealing with that. And at the time, it was very reasonable to uh, have new businesses put in public art when they, put something up, they needed to put something that said, okay, we're really glad to be part of this community and here's a piece of art. And um, that didn't um, work out because in 2008, we had a big, with the economy. And so we had a meeting um, and I think we can go on to the next one because in that meeting, in which we had people beyond the, the pack. We had other people involved. And we decided that the way to really spend some money and make value to the community was to do youth in the arts. There was no money in the schools for art. It's well known, and that last slide shows it, it's well known that if you get art, that you do better, you're smarter. You actually perform higher. So um, we, started the youth in the arts programs in order to enrich our public environment, nurture and enhance and encourage the community's participation, enable 29 Palms to enhance its identity as an art community. And uh, so since then, the city has been supporting youth in the arts. And uh, next slide. 
On the average, we would do to between $100 and $1,000 uh, in non-competitive grants to individuals or organizations to cover student expenses for a range of summer programs and fall events. The funds came from our yearly budget. Grantees include 29 Palms Art Gallery, 29 Palms Creative Center and Gallery, Theater 29, Action 29 Palms, High Desert Cultural Art Center, and Joshua Tree National Park Council for the Arts. Okay. And the PAC and our youth, thank you for your thoughtful consideration over time. And those are all pictures from various events. Okay. And then I want to give a shout out to uh, Action 29 because they, um, Leanne has been very excellent at raising money to do things. So when it came time to do the Desert Storm Homecoming and, and restore that, she said $45,000 and she's was out there raising that money and that was not only from individuals in town but but throughout so in the uh, at the time that I took this the total attendance at the kickoff was um, 55 people and the donations from check cash and online at that time was eleven thousand seventy nine dollars that's a lot of money and she continued to raise money so um, Action 29 can really use uh, support from the city because the murals are p really part of the city's face. And, but it's not that they're just sitting back waiting. And I've, I've just passed on restoration needs to um, Keith. So next. Um, we were also asked to do uh, the street banners and that was competitive. I think that our city managers started thinking about that. And so these now hang at certain times of the year, quite lovely. And um, okay, I think. And the city liaison for PAC has transferred from Randy Council with the Parks and Community Service Director uh, to Travis Clark and now to Keith. And um, the, you know what, I was taking that off. I don't know what time the meetings are on Thursday in City Hall, but <laughs> anyhow, they're once a month and people are invited to go to them. And if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, that's a brief overview. I'll, do, I'll just like to say, um, oh sorry. Pat, thank you very much for all you did with the pack, and um, maybe you can stay in kind of in the background <coughs> and keep, keep uh, or help them out a little bit until they get well, going I, again. Well, I did offer um, my services, and you know, I also want to say something. The city lost Greg Mendoza, and the and the he he on, at, on the planning commission and all of the many uh, places that he volunteered. But Greg was an artist. He came into art later in life. And the first thing he did was bring something to our quarterly show and was forever after with that. And as well, he and his wife and, and mother-in-law, they have a beautiful garden and Morongo Basin Conservation Association uh, featured that. And that garden is on the website for their of native plants, et cetera. So Greg, we're gonna miss you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Council comments and reports of meetings attended. We'll start with Councilmember Mintz. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I went to the State of the City. Was, we held it at, um, at our new gymnasium, so that was quite nice. Uh, I went to the grand opening of the grocery outlet. It was well attended. There was a lot of people there. Uh, I also participated in the city toy giveaway. We gave away all the toys. It was another great success. And then I went to the coffee with the cop. And that was, when I got there, there was almost everybody's gone, but there was still some people there at, uh, so that was still what looked like it was well attended. So, and that's it. Thank you. Council Member Smith? No, Scott. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get, I call him Octavia, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I actually, I went to the State of the City address as well, um, the toy giveaway, coffee with a cop, and the grand opening ceremony for um, uh, grocery outlet. Thank you. Councilman McClain. Thank you. I attended all of those except for the toys giveaway. I had other uh, plans already, 
but I am so happy with the community for coming out and golfing, whoever came out to golf, and for the community for getting all those toys that we could give all the toys away for the uh, kids of 29 Palms. It was a great success, a lot of toys. Um, happy birthday to everybody celebrating a birthday in January, and, act, and also um, happy anniversary to my wife of 40 years, Tori. We celebrate on Saturday, Sunday. All right. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? She needs a certificate. <laughs> 40 years with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome to Kuchina, to the, to the staff. Uh, I've been dealing with her a couple times. She's been, I know she's gone already, but she'll probably listen. But she's been a wonder in there. She's helped me a lot, some questions I've had. I attended the toy drive, the state of the city, the grocery outlet, ribbon cutting, and I think that is it. This is the beginning of the new year for the mayor and myself and everybody, so uh, I wish everyone good health and good wealth and safety and hope we make this year a better year than it was last year. I'm not saying last year was bad. It's just always go forward and be better. And that's all I have. Thank you. And I also attended the uh, toy giveaway. I'm really excited about it and glad that we was able to do it. Um, I did wear my helmet for the golf tournament. Uh, didn't get hit, so we was good. And I also attended the grocery outlet uh, grand opening, which is really exciting and good for the community. So glad to see them here. And I um, want to um, welcome Katrina. And I think that's all I did. So yeah, all right. We good. Thank you. Consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are to be considered routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately by the city council. The public will be given an opportunity to comment on consent calendar items prior to the city council action. So um, anybody want to remove any of the consent calendar items? Everybody's good. I, I don't, I don't want to remove anything, but can we have an explanation for the people about number eight? Uh, so, so uh, item number eight, uh, uh, turn on my microphone here. Item, item number eight, uh, just kind of pull up the staff report here. Uh, staff is recommending a quote from CV Strategies, which is our outreach consultant for an amount not to exceed 42,000 to provide education and outreach. Uh, to comply with SB 1383. SB 1383 is organic diversions. Um, so it is a sta state mandate. Currently, um, as the state has uh, ascertained, um, a lot of our organic waste um, from our houses, from our businesses are going into our trash cans, from our trash cans to the landfill. As they get buried, methane gases are arising, uh, creating impacts to the environment. Uh, GHG, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and uh, contributing to global warming. So the state wants to divert that from the landfill um, and to compost and to uh, uh, reuse uh, these organics uh, when possible. And so there's a state mandate for that. Uh, with that, the, um, our waste hauler, will Burtech, um, this year actually, will be updating our uh, franchise agreement uh, the unfortunate thing with this is it's transportation, which means our Burtec costs are going to increase. Um, this outreach, which comes from Cal Recycle, so it's not general fund money that we're spending. The state of California is paying us for that Cal Recycle to start outreaching, talking to the community, um, and educating them before they get hit with it. Uh, so that's, that's the program in, in summary, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as part of the consent calendar. Okay, anybody in the public want to comment on any consent calendar items or questions? All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Uh, I'd like to abstain from item four, please. I'll move we accept the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Council Member Mintz? Aye. Council Member Scott? Abstain. Only what? from one item, though. You can you can vote yay, and, and we'll abstain on the record for that item. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Klink? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bilderain? Aye. Mayor Wright? Aye. Approved 5-0. Okay. 
open up public hearing. Uh, number nine, development code amendment. Pot belly pigs. All for the piggies. <laughs> How you doing, Mayor Wright, council members? Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so this particular um, ordinance uh, update is to reflect uh, the, the allowance of potbelly pigs as pets. Uh, there is a history of, of the city with potbelly pigs, which, um, which our animal control uh, officer will, will get into. Um, there are height and weight restrictions on these uh, types of pets and other things such as you have to keep them clean, you have to keep them on a leash if you're gonna be in, in public areas and et cetera. So um, we, uh, with, I think I'll just go ahead and hand it over to our animal control officer and he can give a, more of a background on it. Yeah, mayor and council members, we, uh, the city used to allow potbelly pigs with an additional animal entitlement and a, um, and a permit. Um, back in like early or later 2000s, the, it was changed to not allow them anymore, to restrict them. Um, so they illegalized the potbelly pigs. We had a uh, code enforcement officer at that time that was rewriting ordinances and rewrote an ordinance to disallow them in the city. Um, what we want to do is we want to lift that restriction and allow people to have potbelly pigs as long as they abide by certain rules, certain zoning rules. Um, and we, and we want to open that back up for, for our residents, you know. I mean, potbelly pigs are very clean. Um, they're as dirty as you want. Um, if you put a mud puddle out in the back, I'm sure it's going to go in it. But I've owned a potbelly pig in the early 90s, you know, and I trained it. It was, uh, you know, it was litter box trained. I taught it how to walk upstairs. It slept on the couch with me. Um, they're very clean animals. In the summertime, you give them um, suntan lotion so they don't burn. Uh, you wash them, you put lotion on them, and it softens up their hair. I mean, they're, and they're very intelligent. They're very intelligent animals. So with certain restrictions, and then um, I think we should open that back up and allow our residents to own a potbelly pig if, if that's what they want to do. I have a, so with this ordinance, though, there's still a limit, right? They just they can't have like six or seven. Definitely a limit. It's going to be one per, per household. So our one. RS1 zoning, two, three, and four one per household. On the rural areas, the 2.5 acres and the five acres, they'll be allowed two. two okay. But when you're getting back up into the rural five acres, then it's opening up into livestock. Right, livestock, yeah. 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 But I, I guess I was just talking about within Mobile the city. home yeah. parks, no. Apartments, no. Um, duplexes, no. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Just as uh, to add to it, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm showing the particular section of the of the ordinance that the that lists how many you can have. Uh, one acre and below, you can have one. Anything two and a half acres, you can have two. Okay. And they're not considered livestock; they're considered pets. Um, livestock you could either milk or you could get meat off of. Potbelly pigs aren't considered. I know some people can eat them, but they're not considered livestock; they're considered pets. All right. So what do you do when they get over 125 pounds? Well, there's a weight limit, 125 pounds. So. But if you have a pet for four or five years, and all of a sudden it gets a little fat. Yeah, then there's going to be a lot of education. Yeah. Potbelly pigs, pigs have two sweat glands. And what happens is a lot of people will, you know, it's fun to watch them eat cake and eat cookies and eat a half a Subway sandwich, you know. But, you know, you got to really restrict that, you know. Um, they have two sweat glands. They can't lose weight. Um, quick at all so once they gain it they gain it when you train them you train them with low calories like you know like grapes and stuff like that but uh, yeah a lot of education and, and you know I can't wait to go out and educate people with it you know all right yeah so we do we have any um, slips from the public um, I didn't have a lot of slips. yeah I should know better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> It is. Okay. I, I mean, public hearing, I thought that was different than a comment. May I approach? Yes. Okay, cool. And fill out a slip, please. I will. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Carly Hargrove. Uh, I am the owner of wait, a... Wait, I got to open the public oh, hearing again. Ahead. You're good. My bad. <laughs> All right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Carly Hargrove, I'm the owner of a wonderful potbelly pig named Chubbs, 
If you walk by the dog park, the pig will greet you, hopefully if you bring him a treat. Uh, I believe this kind of came because I had hired somebody to come and cut his hooves, and he screamed to all high heavens. I think you could have heard him by Knott's Sky Park all the way to Stater Brothers. Um, so I'm glad you're looking at this policy. Uh, I just want to say that they are not just cute little pets to anybody listening. They cost a lot of money. You have to have their little tusks and hooves done. That's roughly $200. Uh, thankfully, I got here earlier and talked to Mr. Boyd about some of the things that are in the policy with regards to neutering. We can't even get dogs and cats neutered up here. You know, I'm not saying that it's not available, but the wait list is super, super long. And if you go on social media, everyone's giving away a dog, a dog's loose. We don't have pigs, you know, running amok in the city of 29 Palms. So the neutering was my hardest thing to figure out because I have not found a vet to do it. Mr. Boyd said that he would help me with it. So that's great. Um, what else? He answered so many of my questions. I just want to say, please let my piggy stay. Uh, I actually registered him as an emotional support animal when I was diagnosed with cancer in 2020. So I don't know if that falls into any of these policies. Maybe Mr. Boyd can go on that as if my pig is an emotional support animal. But thank you for looking at this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, make sure you fill out a slip. Okay. Greetings. Um, my name is Karen Harper, and I own the property where her pig is. And I did get a couple of complaints, and I got in touch with um, code enforcement, and they told me I needed to get in touch with animal control, and that it was grandfathered in about this um, pot belly pig, and that they, I needed to make sure that there was no flies, no feces, and things like that. They said that it's okay to have it because it's grandfathered in and that it's an emotional support animal, but it does make a lot of noise. I, I own the property, and that's what my tenant told me. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um... If you're going to respond, then no. Uh, I would just like to respond that I wish we could talk about it. That's all. Oh, yeah, y'all can talk uh, offline. All right. Thank you. Tom, like as humans, just having a yeah. conversation works pretty well. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I'll bring it back up to council for further discussion and the motion. So I was reading in there that they have to have a license renewed every year. It would is be a registration, not per se a license. Dogs get licensed for rabies control. Right. Uh, this would be a registration, and it's going to be a registration so animal control, so the city knows where this pig lives, where it belongs. So if it gets out and causes any kind of problems, we'll know who to uh, locate and where the pig belongs, get it back to the residents. Okay. And, and are they going to be allowed in the dog park? No. Okay. Very good. Uh, pigs, just you know, to dogs, make sure. <laughs> dogs don't know what to think of pigs. Yeah. Pigs don't care. Pigs, yeah. they'll go up to any dog, but then mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, it'll be a problem. Okay. But yeah, right. uh, emotional support, there might be questions on that. Um, pigs are not, uh, they're not protected by federal law. Um, service animals are protected by, by federal law. So pigs aren't protected in that for saying. Any more questions? What, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what steps um, are in the, uh, on the new ordinance or policy to, um, uh, to assist with the noise complaints? Uh, well, we have public nuisance complaints. That's in our, in our codes, in the city codes. And then that would be, so if there's a noise complaint, then we would address it as a public nuisance. Just like a barking, whining dog, you know, barking or whining or, anything like that, we'd go forward with a public nuisance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, looking for a motion. Is there an ordinance, uh, Cindy? It'll be 302. Okay, well, I'll make a motion that we adopt uh, ordinance number 302 to allow um, miniature pigs as pets. Well, you can say it again. Yeah. Okay. 
an ordinance of the City Council of the City of 29 Palms amending in its entirety Title 19, Chapter 19.102 of the 29 Palms Municipal Code pertaining to the regulation of animal keeping. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. Councilmember Scott? Aye. Councilmember uh, Council Mintz? Aye. Councilmember Klink? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bildering? Aye. Mayor Wright? Aye. Approved 5 0. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Electric vehicle charging stations and parking requirements. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This, with the update to the building um, codes that we that came into effect January 1st, uh, there is a provision in the building codes with, that pertain to the requirement of of new and rehabilitated um, parking lots to have a certain amount of spaces for electronic vehicles. Um, it is a staff's view that this. Uh, requirement should also be in the in the development code, not just the building code. So that way, we can pass out the parking requirements to anyone that is in our zoning code. This is what you have to comply with. So this is not a, a mandatory thing that we do, but I think it's helpful to the general public and anyone who wants to develop property to acknowledge upfront before they get started on a project as to what um, the requirements would be from them to uh, for electronic vehicle parking spaces. We we can always make this more strict than the, than the building code requires, but we can't make it less strict. So, and that's my presentation. Okay, any questions? Open up public. Anybody got a comment on number 10? All right, close public here. Bring it back to the council for motion. Well, I think it's good um, foresight uh, seeing because it does give the developer time or know ahead of time, especially if somebody's building a duplex, that they are good. Some people might not even know they have to do that. So it would be great to know ahead of time if anybody's building something. So it would be. You got to read that one too? Yes. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of 29 Palms adding text to Section 19, Chapter 19.82.050 of the 29 Palms Municipal Code pertaining to electronic vehicle parking spaces. Thank you. I'll make a motion that we approve um, Ordinance Number 303 as read. I'll second. Roll call. Council Member Klink? Aye. Council Member Scott? Aye. Councilmember Mintz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bildering? Aye. Mayor Wright? Aye. Approved 5 0. Okay, appeal of VHR 22 195. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, this is uh, appeal uh, for VHR 22 195. Location is at 68467 Sullivan Road. The appellant is Catherine Talley Jones. The applicant is Josh and Jody Siegel. Uh, it is zoned for uh, five-acre lots. Uh, I'm so, yeah, five-acre minimum. Uh, there's a three-bedroom uh, structure that is uh, going through the building permit process now with an accessory uh, dwelling unit uh, also on the property at the same time. Uh, the, app, the appellant has cited the following reason uh, as basis for the appeal, that the owner and, and the limited liability corporations with which he is associated are taking advantage of our neighborhoods and our VHR. Uh, regulations and building codes to construct and operate hotels that belong in commercially zoned areas and not in our neighborhoods. Um, and, and our staff's response is uh, vacation home rentals are considered a residential use per our VHR regulations. The lack of long-term tenant does not change the classification from a single-family dwelling. Uh, the issuance of the, VA, uh, of the UHR permit does not rezone or reclassify the property to commercial use or does it change the status from the residential structure to a hotel. Um, per our code, vacation and rental permits are considered ministerial, uh, defined as permit that is granted upon determination that the proposed project complies with the establishment, uh, with the established standards in the zoning code. Therefore, if all their documentation is submitted and the project is in compliance with the development code, the permit will be issued. All required documentation for the VHR has been submitted, and I'll go on into that here in a little bit more in a minute, but the processing of which has been on, put on hold uh, pending these appeals. The structures are pending a final inspection through the building uh, division. 
Here is the location. I know it may be a little hard to see, but this is Sullivan Road here, and this is Montagna here. And the property in question is highlighted here in, in this green. Uh, here are pictures of uh, the site. This was taken in October, and I drove by the site uh, yesterday, and it looks substantially the same as it did in October. Uh, we have uh, the, the floor plans for the primary residence and the accessory dwelling unit that is also uh, in process. Uh, some background here, the, the vacation rental permit was filed in June of last year, June 20th to be exact. The VHR permit uh, notice was given uh, to the neighbors within 300 feet of the property outlined in green uh, and it was sent by staff on October 5th of 2022. The objection to the VHR was received on October 17th. The Planning Commission overrode the objection on November 15th, 2022, and the appeal of the Planning Commission denial was filed on November 29th, 2022, and this is the first City Council uh, that, that we could bring it to because of the holidays. All vacation rental permit applications need to comply with the following requirements, among other items. <clears throat> One is a safety inspection. There's uh, insurance requirements and a good neighbor training course for those permits filed after uh, 624 2022 this one happened to beat that deadline by a few days and a septic certification dated with one year for um, existing resident uh, existing buildings since this is a new building they have to get a new septic permit anyway uh, the VHR has not yet completed the safety inspection and will be required to complete the good neighbor training course prior to the first renewal if it gets approved uh, for the City Council's verification uh, or information here, the city limit is 500 uh, VHR permits over the whole city. That is per our code. As of today, 460 have been permitted, another 40 in process, and there's eight on a waiting list. So, <clears throat> this is a, 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 an exhibit that we put together that shows the um, vacation home rental permits, I realize it may be a little hard to see, uh, but these green dots are showing uh, the, the approved vacation home rental permits in the vicinity of Indian Cove and points, uh, and points west. Uh, for edification, uh, the proposed vacation home permit is approximately in this location here. Um, if we were to zoom out for the whole city, this is uh, the vacation home uh, rental permits as it is permitted throughout the whole city there uh, and there are clusters all over uh, the city um, and if we were to compare uh, for instance this is, happens to be the southeast side of town we put out we took out one section of the city to compare it's you know without doing a statistical analysis by 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 rough analysis here uh, it is roughly the same density uh, as what we're seeing in, in the Indian Cove area. Um, our recommendation is that the City Council conduct a public hearing, consider public comment, and deny the appeal to allow staff to continue processing uh, the vacation home rental permit. And that's our presentation. Any question for staff? Oh. Go ahead. What is their reason to on their appeal? What is the actual verbiage? That is a verbiage. That, I mean, that was just. Yeah. When did the individual build a home? Uh, you know, I, I don't have an exact date for that, but the building permits are processed separately from the vacation rental permits, so they. But the building was done. Then he did the permit for. Mm -hmm. They're still working on the. Yeah. They're still working on the on the on the building permits. They haven't passed all the inspections. But he didn't walk in and say, "I need a permit to build a." Airbnb. That's what the VHR is. It's a permit for the Airbnb. But he's but and they started building before they even had to. Yeah. So in. when you uh, turn in a, a building uh, uh, permit, um, there's not a a use question, you know, that's there. So, i.e., are you going to live in it? Are you going to rent it? Are you going to rent it? To, yeah, that's not a question in the building and safety side of it. So. And and the building permit, uh, the, the buildings are meeting residential building codes. Can I see that the blueprint? I have a question. You 
wait, we're not, we're not there yet, and you need to have a green slip. Okay. Anybody else got questions? Are these yeah. are these are the are these two separate buildings? Yes, there's a primary residence and a detached accessory. So they're building. they're going to live in that primary residence, and then the, this here two bedroom is the VHR. The the vacation rental permit covers both of these structures. Excuse me. Okay. Do I get a chance as the appellant to make a presentation? Is that coming up? Or? So, okay. So, um, in the staff report, it says that um, um, that an Airbnb or a short-term rental can actually be denied if it's um, if it affects the safety, health, and uh, welfare. Um, it also says that if it's injurious to the community, um, define that. What is injurious to the community? Okay. So, as far as the public health and safety and welfare. As staff, uh, we the, the building permit as long as it meets building codes. Let's just take one thing at a time. If it makes if it meets building codes, then by de facto it meets health and safety because of the actual structure of the building uh, as a residence. Um, for vacation home rentals, these are the items that that we require as far as protecting health and safety: the safety inspection, the insurance requirements, a good neighbor policy, and et cetera. Um, there is a, a, a process within the VHR um, regulations that that cover those contingencies where the vacation rental um, owner doesn't behave themselves. So if there's noise compl uh, continuous noise complaints or disturbances to the neighbors of one way or another, they could lose the vacation rental permit. Thank you, but 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 that word injurious, right? That that's a very unique word right there injurious to the community so um, I mean if you're a member of this community obviously somebody feels like they're they're being injured in some way because they're they've made an appeal um, so can you can you actually narrow in on that one please <clears throat> well um, you know that's um, you know the code is from a staff perspective is black and white and all we have from a black and white perspective is what is in front of us. Uh, that injurious side of it um, is interpretive. Um, the staff, though, only has those questions to make sure safety. There's no, so th the building is safe, right? You know, so the community, those who rent it and otherwise won't be hurt. Um, insurance, their protection if there are claims against that. The good neighbor to make sure that they don't disturb, they know the rules and don't disturb their neighbors. Um, the septic to make sure that it is functioning. So those are the questions and answers that we address that. Um, you know, council can always add, you know, if they feel appropriate to the code to add more um, uh, check boxes, if you will. Uh, but those are the only check boxes that we have to answer those questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna open it up to the public. I need green slips. Yeah, you can fill out a green slip and you can talk for three minutes. Um, I understood the different situation being the appellant. Can I add one three minutes? Mm, three minutes. Okay. Are you going to speak? Well, you, you can fill it out afterwards. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank the city council for providing another opportunity to appeal the vacation home rental VHR permit for 68467 Sullivan Road. Yeah, thank you. Um, in any cove, and I'd also like to thank Mayor Pro Tem Steve Bilderain for hearing our concerns uh, late last year. I'm Kat Talley-Jones. 
my husband John and I live full time in 29 Palms. The VHR we're peeling is on the northern end of our property. We are continuing this peel despite the recommendation that it be denied by the Planning Commission at its November 15 meeting. Despite what we've heard this evening, we still maintain that 6846 Sullivan, a five bedroom, 2,500 square foot structure, or rather a main structure in ADU under one VHR permit, was built from the ground up to be a boutique hotel and is not a residence. It's not appropriate in a residential community. This property is owned by Mr. Joshua Siegel, who is a principal at Field Trip Hospitality. Field Trip promotes its VHRs as curated homes for group travel that combine the best aspects of a home with the brand promise of a high-end boutique hotel. Um, another couple of slides. One more. Okay. There's the vision. So we are committed to setting the standard for branded luxury short-term rental experiences, one that combines the best aspects of a home with the brand promise of a high-end boutique hotel. The field trip properties are marketed on field trip's own site, their own website, on Airbnb and Expedia, along with other local hotels. Uh, next slide. Oops. They got out of order. Just a couple more. <coughs> one more. And one more. Yes, thank you. Expedia page. Field trip hotels. Field Trip Hospitality is a limited liability corporation, or LLC, connected in a web of LLCs with Amok Modern, a developer, whose principal is Dan Singh, who is also a partner at Field Trip. Evoke is a developer of dozens of properties within the Morongo Basin. Field Trip's business address is Mr. Siegel's home address in Culver City. Mr. Siegel is listed as owner or is connected to two other properties that are about to come online as VHRs or that are under construction as well as five undeveloped parcels in the area. Mr. Siegel, in his remarks at the November 15 Planning Committee meeting, said that 68467 Sullivan is a personal passion project, and that he, his family, he and his family hope to spend time living in it one day. Um, will they also live in the two-story property at 7050 Indian Cove? He's listed as owner on the San Bernardino par County parcel map. Or one of the 10 or so properties owned and managed by Field Trip throughout the Morongo Basin? Uh, but another issue that perhaps should have been considered um, before the building was even constructed and perhaps prevented it from being constructed and also considered in future development is that it is sited within the Joshua Tree National Park buffer zone. The 29 Palms General Plan states the zone protects, enhances, and expands the scenic vistas and resources adjacent next to the National Park by discouraging development that could potentially impact these resources. 68467 Sullivan is in that buffer zone. How is that allowed to happen? At least two undeveloped properties owned by Field Trip, the Field Trip Web of LLCs in Indian Cove are also within that zone. I have just a little bit more. May I continue? Yeah, go ahead. We have other questions. Um, should the construction of high-end boutique hotels be permitted on undeveloped lots and removed as potential residential housing during a time when affordable single family residences are scarce. There was a comment from the Planning Commission last November that in a year or so, 6846 Sullivan might be sold and could become a residence. This five bedroom, 2,500 square foot property and the other field trip properties would likely sell for a million dollars or more. How does this provide housing in a community where the 2020 census record records show that the an average annual income is $43,000 and a quarter live below the poverty line. We maintain that these boutique hotels should not be allowed to operate in residential neighborhoods. And for this reason, the property should not be granted a vacation home rental. We ask that there be closer oversight of building permits for single family residences so that these boutique hotels are not constructed in our neighborhoods. And we request much closer scrutiny of building permits within the National Park buffer zone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I got um, Mr. Khrushchev. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you, and uh, fellow council members. My name is Jim Khrushchev, and I wanted the opportunity to come up here having served on the committee that reviewed our vacation home rental uh, ordinance 
and made the recommendations to you about six months ago and those that were accepted. Now, the question on VHRs, that was a question that came up here over eight years ago. And the city made the decision. Yes, we, we know that VHRs are real and we're going to have an ordinance and put it in place. And that was, that was a real smart on our part because we were way ahead of the county. We put a regulation in place and we worked with that. As VHRs became more popular, we relooked at the ordinance, put the committee together. The committee came together and brought recommendations to you back in May 10th. One of the recommendations we had was to limit the number of uh, licenses to two per entity. And by entity, that could be an individual, an LLC, a Chapter S corporation. The council, in their wisdom, decided to make it at least five. So any one entity, whether it's an LLC or an individual, can have five licenses, up to five licenses. And that was decided by our council. The other thing was <coughs> we also looked at a limit. And a limit was set. So we've set a limit. So we've come back. We've looked. We set a limit of five licenses per individual or entity. It's a single family home. And we set a limit of 500 total for the community. So I think we've looked at it, and what we now have is somebody who's used our ordinance, come to us, met every requirement, and they should be offered the chance to run this VHR. So I'm asking the committee to, you know, abide by the ordinance that we passed, that's all. And I will speak from a personal uh, stand. I live in Rural Living 2.5 Acre. There are five VHRs that are along uh, Samarkand uh, going from Encelia. Th three of them were absolute derelict homes. They are now nice homes. There's no problem. They, I, I never hear any complaints. I never hear or hear any problems coming from them. And I know that the money that we collect from our VHR TOT taxes make up a good portion of our TOT taxes. So it's got, there are a lot of positives. I understand some people do not like VHRs. And that generally is what it is. It's, I do not like VHRs. I don't want to live next door to one. And the only thing I can say is, for those people, uh, you know, elect somebody who believes that way <laughs> into your council, um, form a homeowners association. There are many avenues if you want to keep it out of your area that you can do. But the community as a whole has already approached this question. So all I ask is that we abide by the ordinance that we passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Cindy Bernard. Hi. As you know, I was also on uh, with, with Councilman Bilderang and Councilman Mintz on the STR committee. So I'm also approaching this as a committee member who was involved in the writing of the ordinance. <coughs> um, a couple of questions. What's the line between a commercial structure and a residential structure? Is a commercial structure deemed a residential structure just because it's built in residential zoning? Um, Evoke, Field Trip, and Blue Sequoia are smartly exploiting a loophole, and I agree. The ordinance is written makes this appeal very difficult, but what they're doing, I believe, very smartly, it's a smart move, they're exploiting a loophole. They're building new luxury commercial structures from scratch that look like houses, but they're really a cross between a house and a luxury hotel suite. Um, and they're distributed throughout the Morongo Basin. It's like a hotel chain. It's like a, it's like a mass distributed hotel in parts across the hotel, across the Morongo Basin. This chain's front desk exists on social media, and its offices are in Highway 62. As you enter Yucca Valley, I'm sure you've seen the building. They're unlike anything we've seen before. Certainly when we were on the STR committee, we didn't envision people building structures that were designed to be STRs from scratch, because that's what this is. Um, and it's certainly not the type of local business, like the type of local home-based business, that we envisioned as an exception to residential zoning. These guys aren't fixing cars in their garage part-time or doing bookkeeping in a home office. So there's only as so much you, you can do under the current ordinance. There's no question about that, as, 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 as Jim points out. But this is what I would recommend. Defer making a decision on the appeal pending further research if you feel you have the ability to do that. Consider enacting a temporary moratorium on granting STR permits to new single-family residential construction. We're in a housing crisis after all. We need new construction that people can actually live in, not construction that's designed to be an STR from the ground up. 
either ban permitting new single family residential for STRs or enact a three year waiting period before new construction can be permitted to STRs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any more green slips. All right. <laughs> Hey, Campbell. I can't read the first name. Campbell. Bo, thank you. Um, I'm new to the area. I'm currently building a home that I plan on living in that is going to be beautiful, and I plan on traveling. And I would love to have people stay at the property where I'm at while I'm gone and maybe make a couple dollars towards my mortgage. And they get the, the chance to enjoy 29 palms enjoy the national park you take that outside sir and uh you know i completely believe in everything that jim said regarding the ordinance i do have a question though how was this person able to apply for the permit prior to the building being completed because i think that's against your ordinance so, and again, I would love for this man to have his vacation home rental permit because I'm completely for them. But I think that the procedure and the policies has a lot of holes in it at this point. Thank you. Okay, next we have ooh, Eric. Okay. So, as Eric's coming up, just to kind of answer that question. Uh, yeah, you know, there are, and some people have speculated, and I know the gentleman actually is, is one of those who, you know, uh, are building a house that probably by the time they're complete with the house, the 500 will be complete. So if you build a house and you're complete while there's still 500, that's okay, right? But if you apply for a permit and let's say it's not going to be done for a year from now, we're not going to hold a license. So that's kind of the difference between what's now and you know, a project that won't be built into the future. All right, so um, I'm Eric from Desert Beacon, Eric Menendez. Um, you know, I, I stood up here at the Planning Commission meeting talking about the second dollar general coming into town, not being for it and stuff, and pretty much it was explained, well, we need all the requirements, whether you like it or not, it's gonna happen. And as Mr. Kushat said, I mean, that's gonna happen with this as well, because they meet all the requirements. But I think we need to look at the bigger picture and say, hey, anyone can form an LLC and do five of them here, five of them here, five of them here. But there's not just one of these homes in Indian Cove, there's like four coming, or there's a lot. So I think we need to look at that and in in, in bringing BHR back to, back to council, you know, or back to a committee. And I think that we should look at making sure things like this don't happen in, in you know, tight at neighborhoods. Cause it's, you know, we live, or we represent two houses that are right behind the two story one that's coming from the same company. And it basically took out the view, took out the mountains, took out everything for all the people below it. And that's actually the next item we're going to talk about too. But I, I just don't think we've worked very hard at, at Desert Beacon being public enemy number one you know, ever since I started the company. And now it's like, you know, it's, you, you know, we just got to make sure we're doing this reasonably and responsibly. So, so other companies don't come in and say, hey, let's open up 10 houses as well and run them like this. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, Vino. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I live at 718-2929 Palms Highway. I bring almost uh, 40 years of experience to the hotel hospitality uh, business. It's a beautiful building. Thank you. And the thing that catches me, it says boutique hotel. But I do know that the city do collect tax from the STR, which means you can only collect tax if it's zoned hospitality. Now, if this owner knew there was building a boutique hotel, why would you do it in a residential area? So much of commercial land. I welcome competition. Uh, council knows that there's a Hilton going in downtown, uh, not a five room, almost a hundred room. I welcome those owners. So I think we need to put boutique hotels or just in commercial buildings in commercial 
sections. But at the same time, the city council also has a history of doing spot zoning. You had done a spot zoning for the Sunnyvale Hotel when it was apartments. You had done a spot zoning for the Harmony uh, Motel when it wasn't zoned. So you probably uh, need to, just like this thing Eric said, that revisit STR and if this owner knew that he was going to do uh, almost a 2,500 uh, square feet of boutique hotel, we should say, can you also give us 2,500 square feet of affor uh, affordable housing? Try, let's try to mitigate these things because we do have a housing shortage and we can build commercial in a residential area. Thank you. No more green slips. I do have one. Oh, okay. How's it going? <laughs> My name is Alex Garcia. Um, I was born and raised here. Um, I work a lot with the homeless and a lot of the families that have been affected by these short-term rentals. Um, I don't think anybody really realizes the effect it actually does on a small community. We, um, we don't make a lot of money here, unfortunately, and the homes, the families that are affected have children and they have their entire families. Um, I provide them warm clothes during the winter. Um, <laughs> during the summer, I try to make sure that they have water and things like that. I think the things that people are not realizing is there's children living in cars because of these situations. There's families. Um, it's disheartening seeing that I was born and raised here. Um, it's sad to see the community turn into this. Um, yeah, we can talk about how much we don't want them to be our neighbors or whatever it may be, but the truth is there's people that are homeless now and they're going without food because they can't afford places to live because of the hike and everything that's gone up. Um, and yeah, there isn't many places for people to live that are affordable. Um, people can shake their head all that they want. The truth is, I'm out there and I'm clothing them, and it sucks. It, it's terrible. It's disgusting. Um, um, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't planning on speaking. Um, we can ignore it all we want. Out of sight, out of mind is a real thing, but you guys are the leaders of this, this town, this community. Hold up to that and, you know, <laughs> look at everything. The fact that uh, there's kids living in cars, dude. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Okay. Um, I have one, um, we got one email from Heather Vincent, and the gist of her thing is, um, I asked for more rigorous regulations and oversight of new buildings with the primary purpose of VHRing need to occur, otherwise we have enabled Mintz's original fear to use the VHR regulation as a loophole for hotels in our residential communities. That's it. I'm going to close public hearing, bring it back up to the council for further discussion and a motion. Well, unfortunately, um, this, this part of it wasn't discussed at the committee. And a after the committee, um, you know, over the last six months, like four or five other items have been brought up. But it wasn't, you know, when we made the ordinance, it just, it wasn't, um, we never put any restrictions in there. These these folks um, went by the letter of what we put out. So I don't see how, um, you know, I'd have to deny the appeal. I've been um, just sitting here listening and um, just to let everybody know, um, when we did approve the VHR um, ordinance we are to review that again coming up very soon and with what's being said and everything we definitely have to bring this sort of thing to the front of discussion um, like 
new builds must use that for two years prior to changing it to a VHR or um, let's cut down on the LLCs, you know, the number that he, uh, LLCs can have here in Square Palms. But like Danny said, they have gone by the book with this and I, I just don't see how we can um, deny this. Or deny it. We have to deny it. <coughs> don't deny it. I think the current policy is, uh, is broad um, and it's open to interpretation. Um, you know, I live in a neighborhood that's flooded with Airbnbs myself. There are people in my neighborhood, there's families of five living in one bedroom apartments. Um, I, I cannot in good faith um, allow Airbnbs to destroy our community. I've been, I was on the committee as everyone's heard and uh, I was, I sat for two hours with the people doing the appeal and I've, and it's, it's been, it's been hard because I understand where they're coming from, I see it, but the, they went by the ordinance. All I can, what we can do now is make sure it can't continue to happen. So like all the other councils said, we have to fix our policy and our ordinance and get that verbiage better, not so broad. Um, we need to fix this. There is a problem coming. Uh, there's patterns that we see and that has been brought to our attention from the people, residents doing the appeal. But like everyone said, they have done everything right. So it's hard to deny it or so well we got to fix it and uh, we have a lot of things on the scratch down to uh fix these problems that's all i got so i um you know it being broad and open to interpretation you know i, I don't know what it means to be injurious to a community um i don't have definitions on 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 public so, uh, safety welfare there's not a lot of metrics and so i just you know, I, I honestly think that we should table this one um, until we get more clarity. Well, um, I'm glad that we're bringing it back because we do need to close the loopholes and things like that. And, um, you know, just listening to everybody and what, what has been said, um, I think it's really important that it's been pointed out some of the things and I mean we've even seen it and that was one of the my biggest concern is always um, having outside entities and LLCs and things like that come in and buy a property and and all that kind of stuff like that you know so um, I think we're going to be split on tonight because I can't deny this appeal not in my heart so um i don't know where we go from here frank <laughs> so it's it's a, it's, it's a vote <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um be, because obviously you know we have to we have to look at this objectively and have to look at what the what was written when these folks applied and what was written is what they applied for. So I'm gonna make a motion that we deny the appeal. I'll second. Okay, roll call. Council Member Scott? Nay. Council Member Mintz? Yes. Council Member Clink? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bildering? Nay. Mayor Wright? Nay. Wow. Approved. Uh, zero or two three <laughs> right yeah, so well it was denied to two three but the vote is two three two in so, favor so three opponent. yeah so, so is there an, an alternative uh, motion because that that failed because there's three no's mm -hmm. yeah we need to pull that individual in how he's verbally saying he's a hotel and all this stuff we need to get knocked down like what is this really going to be because he can't say he's been in a hotel and boutique in that residential area. That was not, he said he's going to be an Airbnb, right? not a boutique. So that's where my problem is. That's where I'm voting for it because he says he's going to be a build an Airbnb. We'll fix that problem in our policy. But when you put on this boutique, hotel, blah, 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 that's not what he said. That's not what we're about. That's not what the policy says. Airbnb, not hotel, boutique. So he needs to fix his verbiage and hold down to an Airbnb type strategy, not what he wants to do. He wants to come into our neighborhood, 
plays by our rules. Yeah. So, yeah, so staff is uh, still looking for an alternative motion because the, um, yeah, so it was a 3-2 denial of, uh, or it's, the motion failed. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to request more information from staff and postpone the hearing to a date certain. Second. Okay. Do we, do we want to do we want to make that after we have the discussion of the um, VHRs then? The when we discuss the ordinance. Yeah, I think that's important that it needs to be after that. Okay. So I mean, staff could come back with yeah. stuff yeah. for the next meeting, and then we haven't had our discussion on the VHRs yet. Yeah. And one thing that uh, that I'll. Uh, uh, have a legal opinion on it as well because the, the applicant did apply based on the current policy and uh, just so council is aware of that. But his current policy is an Airbnb, not a hotel boutique, like he's saying. So that's what he's that's the problem. And he's not done. The building's not done, right? Right. They're still going through inspections through the building process. Then his second conceit this area is that completed? Mm, I have to double check. I don't have any information. Last one I drove by, it looked look completed, so I don't know how the safety inspections completed there yet. So he's not the, done. The safety inspections have not been done yet. So he's not warranted yet anyway, so we can't even give him a permit if we changed it right now. So he's not completed. He's still in the loophole. He's still on the waiting list, right? Yep. Well, they, the comment that was made about they're going to build – six or seven more once we get to 500 right now the way the ordinance reads they, they can't do that i mean if they started tomorrow they would all our, our permits are going to be filled up they wouldn't be able to do it anyway so i mean i'm not yeah, but they could build it and be on the waiting list well they could be on the waiting list yeah um yeah after the after we discuss the pot the code so, so the council wants to table this uh, public hearing. Is that is that the consensus that that we're hearing? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. So I, so I heard three we, anyway. Yeah. As long as we can discuss or have a meeting with the VHR ordinance and address these issues that we're addressing now, or that are that have been brought up. Okay, staff has directions. Okay. All right. Nah, Don't. it failed, so they tabled it. They, they just put, they just tabled it, so it's tabled. Okay. Close public hearing. Discussion and potential action items. Initiation of study of two-story homes in Indian Code. Okay, uh, this is very much related to the last item. Um, as we heard today, and we've been hearing for a while, um, several members of the public have raised concerns about two-story homes in Indian Cove. Um, a little bit of background, uh, our current development standards for all single-family residential zones, uh, regardless if it's Indian Cove or not, uh, have a 35-foot height maximum. Uh, this includes RSE, RS1, RS2, RS3, and RS4. The, residential single family. Uh, the development code does not mention stories as a development standard. It's height, 35 feet height. Um, so if we were to go ahead and study this issue uh, as staff and as the planning commission, uh, the f one of the things we really need direction on from the city council is the geographic dimensions of, of where this policy would apply, if it would apply citywide if it applies to certain zones or what the city council's take on is and so right I, I do have our, our gis system up and if we need to look up certain properties or zones we can do that well so right now yes yeah, so our zone right now for height is 35 feet so they could put a two-story in with 35 feet that's correct correct so in other words we'd have to study um the height limit really i mean there's multiple Because that ways. seems to be the issue, how high the, the structure is as compared to what it is. If it's Right. There, there, there are several ways of, of, of approaching this. 
uh, and we'll take this to the Planning Commission with different alternatives. Uh, one could be a zoning code amendment to minimize the height um, in certain zones or in citywide. If this only needs to be in, in the Indian Cove area, then we, we would need directions to how, what the geographic area of what it would be affected, whether it goes all the way up to two mile or if it stays at 29 Palms Highway in the eastern boundary, west boundary, that kind of thing. So we're asking for a little bit of, of direction as what the city council's intent is. I'd like to see it just all one story. Yeah, citywide. <laughs> citywide? Well, citywide. I, th I think it should be, by this planning commission, it should be studied citywide, not just one area, and then look at the height, which obviously, um, if, you have a, if you have a building, if you have it 30 feet and you put a loft in, would that, would that be, you know, as a bedroom, say, was that, would that be considered two-story? So, no. So that's where I guess we don't want, we want to make this so if someone understands when they come here to build something, they know what they're getting into. And if we, so I think it should be that we look at it citywide with height is the, not for, the story. For single family zones, you for think? For single family zones, yes. Plus we have earthquakes here. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be in the second story when but Not to go hit. backwards, but the house that we just talked yeah. about, Airbnb, it's a one story, but it's high. Yeah, right. So it's pretty much two story, but it's very vaulted ceilings. So we need to... Yeah. Go back to normal where single family homes or whatever that height is, but yeah. you don't need big old patios in front of. I, it's not two story, but I still got this monstrous house doing the same thing a two story did. You know, that well, that's why I, that's yeah. why the height is. I think the height issue is is yeah. more what we need to focus on. Not that it's a one or two yeah. story. The height issue is, and I I believe it should also be citywide. That's my opinion. So, so Mr. Mayor, maybe uh, before discussion, maybe public uh, comment first. Yeah. And oh, okay. Anybody in front of the public? All right. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Heidi Hurd. And um, I would really like to see a study done on this, which is what the, th what the uh, item is, is that you want to have a study done. And I will be forwarding a picture, some pictures of one of the two stories in Indian Cove from this evening that I just took and from the neighbors that took it behind because they, the neighbors to the north of this house have lost their entire view of the park and everything else because this building, VHR, was built so far back on the lot and it's two stories, etc. I mean, I live on the other street, and I'm like, wow, look at the lights. So I'm going to be sending, these e the, sending the photos that I took to you guys. But please do a study on this, especially when it comes to what's inside the National Park Buffer Zone, because this, this, this two-story right here has totally killed that view for people. Okay, I got... Um, oh, wait. Oh. Yeah, Eric. All right. <clears throat> Hello again. I think I've waited three years to say this, but I'm with Heidi on this one. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just I have two clients that are on that street on that block, and that construction on the corner of Quail Springs, and I forget the name of that street, but it just totally. What's that? Pine oh, Pine Springs. Thank you. Pine Springs. Pine Springs Sullivan. Sullivan, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. So anyway, so I just think it's it's just it's very impactful for those homeowners that we represent, and it's just it's out of character. And I know we talk about what defines residential character in a neighborhood when we're talking about the code, BHR code, building code, whatever. But I just think yeah, definitely something they need to take a hard look at this because it, it definitely impacted those whole two blocks, you know, north and south. So anyways, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Sydney, you don't have twelve check. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just read this so I can get it all in. Um, you know, it, it is an odd coincidence that these, these two-story structures are, of course, also Blue Seagull Evoke and, I mean, or, yeah, Blue, Blue Sequoia Evoke field trip structures. Anyway, um, and I agree with you, it would be great for the whole city, but I wrote this about Indian Cove. Um, Indian Cove is a vista that's unique in the city and rare in the Morongo Basin because the iconic rock formations of Joshua Tree National Park are actually visible from 62 only in Indian Cove. The rocky formations, that looks different than anywhere else in the city. 
Um, the view from the highway is crucial from tourists, and they're and the view from one's home is important to residents. That's why a scenic vista that's worth, that's worth preserving by restricting the height of new construction to a single story, maybe about 15, 16 feet, something like that. You may ask, what are the boundaries of Indian Cove? Since my grandfather bought property there in 1961, and I have a picture somewhere of my grandma standing next to the sign that says Indian Cove land for sale, um, I can kind of prove a little bit where Indian Cove is. It's the area immediately north of the Indian Cove campground. So the easternmost house is the Lucky House on Rattlesnake Canyon uh, wash. And the western Mort street, that's a little harder, but it's like Montoya or Kern. And of course, it would be 62 on the north and the park boundary on the south. It should be noted that the area south of Sullivan in Indian Cove is in the Joshua Tree National Park buffer zone. Here's the general plan language again. The intent of the Joshua Tree National Park buffer overlay is to protect, enhance, and expand scenic vistas and resources adjacent to the National Park by discouraging development that could potentially impact these resources. Strongly discourage intensification of existing allowable development densities within the National Park overlay, and development standards shall be established with the goal of preserving the scenic vistas and resources along the National Park. So I'm kind of confused as to how one of the two-story structures and the STR under appeal were built without planning giving them special attention to the general plan, and perhaps requiring a CEQA review since preserving CEQA vista, scenic vistas is also a CEQA element. Um, I'm hoping that our new planning commissioners will pay closer attention to the general plan and to houses and any kind of structure that's actually built in the National Park uh, buffer zone. Um, in any case, we need to preserve what makes 29 Palms and Indian Cove unique, um, including its scenic vistas. And so I strongly advocate limiting structures in Indian Cove to one story, which is, I think, approximately 15 feet. Thank you. Karen Harper. Hello. My name is Karen Harper, and I'm an owner of Janine's Beauty Supply in 29 Palms. We've been in business for seven years. In the process of we've been in business for seven years, we also purchased property. We own three buildings. Now, one of our property is on Palmville. We had an engineer come out we had a survey done to have a two-story built in a residential area. I think two stories are wonderful. I'm from the city. I don't know anything about the country. I am from the city. I don't feel that it's fair that it should be limited to a single family resident. I think if people want to have a two-story, they should be able to build a two-story especially if it's in the ordinance that they can have two stories. Now, the city planning said in their proposal for us, if we did a two-story, then we can have garages underneath the buildings or separate garages. When you build new construction, you have to have a garage. So if you say, um, Councilman, that it should only be just single family residents, what happens to us? And we're in the process of building a two story in Palmview on Gagonio. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more green slips? May I, can I just add something to what the lady just said? I need an. In fact, uh, I've, I've listening, already given you the green slip. Two story building can be 20 feet high. Um, uh, I live in a two-story building, and it's with the roof pitch, it's about about 25 feet. But I can understand where the people are upset where somebody came in and said, I'm building a single-family residence, and he had in mind to build a boutique hotel in a residential neighborhood. And we all know if you build a hotel, you need a CUP. And I'm kind of surprised that one of the planning commissioners even came and went to bat for them. Uh, so we can have a two-story building, but we have a height amount restriction, maybe no more than 20 feet, or to see 25 feet. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bring it back to the council.
for a motion or discussion on it. I, I think it's pretty clear they needed to study it. <laughs> and I think if we agree that it needs to be the entire city and also pay attention to the height. Now for the lady, it's a study on the whole city, not saying the whole city is going to be single, just a study. No, so this, um, yeah. this councilman right here said yeah. for the whole city it should just be single family residents. Yeah. He said that it shouldn't be any two stories. Yeah, but it's it's going to be a study. It's going to be a study. That was my that was me saying what I would like. But it's not. It it could be four to one. Okay. Okay. Good. I think we've got some direction. All right. We'll uh, we'll we'll begin the the study and we'll uh, brief the planning commission as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay. Number 13, Planning Commission appointment. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, the item in front of you uh, this evening is a future agenda item request. Um, and hi historically, the request is Planning Commission appointments. Um, and it was very timely. I think the future agenda item request came in December uh, because we have three planning commissioners up for um, uh, vacancies. Uh, historically, the Planning Commission vacancies are recommended by the council members, uh, ap appointed by the mayor as a committee assignment. So we strategically, in the agenda this evening, had the committee assignments next pending this item. Um, so again, in that uh, assignment, there are, and historically, there have always been two members of the council who looked at the uh, applications uh, recommended to the full council uh, for, uh, for adoption. Um, um, when staff uh, was looking at this staff report, uh, we did not uh, find anything written to this effect as it relates to the committee. Uh, attached to the staff report is the development code, um, and it does recite in there that uh, we'll be appointed uh, by the pleasure um, uh, of the city council uh, in its in entirety, but it doesn't go further to say the uh, the committee. Uh, in consultation with the uh, city clerk, uh, one of our uh, longtime employees, maybe our longest uh, employee, Cindy, currently, Rick. Um, um, so historically, 20 years plus, this is the way we do it. Um, just because the way we've done it doesn't mean the way you have to continue to do it, but that has been a historical presence. Uh, precedent. Uh, just by way of example, uh, alternatives, uh, Yucca Valley, each individual council member appoints, and again, same thing, the full council uh, approves. Just by one another uh, example, Dana Point, our city attorney who represents Dana Point, uh, all the planning commissioners actually interview in the full council and then they recommend an appoint. So, uh, in other words, there are many ways to handle this, um, and the way that uh, we've handled it in the past, again, is the two members recommend to the council. So just wanted to serve that up back to the council. It is a future agenda item request to see if the council wants to change that policy. Now, when you do say that the, the committee um, recommends, when it comes to the council, we, we won't have to accept all the applicants. We can reject one, two, or all three and say we want to redo it, we want to re reopen it. So it doesn't mean it's locked into the two that... The, the the folks that they recommend so I just want to I don't know that was kind of not said so anybody else yeah I think that um, from my experience um, it's actually very common for council members to appoint um, their own their own uh, when I say their own uh, planning commissioner um, I think that the way we've been doing it before um, makes sense for at-large elections, but since then the city has actually moved towards district elections. And so I think it makes a little bit more sense that um, each council member actually appoints a, a planning commissioner with full ratification of the full, of the full council. Um, I think that having a, a committee to do this, it becomes a little cumbersome. It, uh, you know, it adds an extra step that's not necessarily needed. Um, and so I just think that uh, we should kind of move away from the way we've been doing it. So are you saying that each one of us finds somebody in our district to sit on the planning commission? 
No, I, I don't think that it should be restrict, restricted to districts, um, but I do think that um, each council member who represents a district should uh, be able to appoint a, a planning commissioner. It, so the planning commissioner could be outside of their district. I also think, though, too, because right now we have three planning commissioner slots that are coming up um, that are going to be vacant, um, and we have three people who just... Um, one uh, election, right? And so I would recommend that um, we coincide that along with the with the election cycle. So the so next time the the next two council members um, will be able to appoint their commissioners. Mr. Mayor, uh, public comment Wait. before too much discussion. Oh, yeah. back there. Go ahead. Senator Bernard. Hi again. Hey, I just wanted to say that I think it's really important to have greater transparency in the appointment of the Planning Commission. When Planning Commissioners were appointed in 2020, it was actually something I was interested in, but in fact, I never saw an ad, I never saw an announcement, I never saw anything to even know that it was happening, and then it happened, and it was too late. So, um, no way I'm going to apply for Planning Commission now, thanks, I'm happy with the appointment I have. But um, I think, I, I, in my opinion, I think that there should be some citizen involvement in the appointment process. I'm not sure how that would work, but I think it would give greater transparency to the process, and I think that's important. Um, I also, uh, I respectfully will disagree with Councilman Scott. I actually think it should be by district, and I think we've gone too long with like District 1 and District 4, for instance, not having representation on the Planning Commission. And so I do think there should be a, a planning commissioner for District 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to ensure that there's representation across the city on the planning commission and that it doesn't get concentrated in one or two districts. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, any more green slips? All right, further discussion? Yeah, so, you know, I guess in, in, a, in a perfect world, you know, we would, we would um, appoint them per district. I do, I do foresee a problem with that, um, uh, the city being as small as it is. I think it'd be very difficult to recruit from, from each district. And so that's why I wouldn't limit it to districts. But in a perfect world, I, I do agree with, with Cindy Bernard. Yeah, I'll just say the same thing you took pretty much all the words. Um, Districting, that's a, the city didn't even want to do this. We were going to get sued. The only reason we're in district now we're about to get sued for it. So that whole district thing, does, it takes away actually from the community. Because I got 10 applicants right now for this. If we do three appointed people, that's three. That means what, seven of them are not gonna ever get looked at because council members are gonna choose their uh, rep. And so seven individuals who could be very good at being a planning commission will never get opportunity because we took the applications away or we can allow all applications in and those three council members are going to pick out of those 10. Is that how you looking at it like that? Um, no, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. that, yeah, not just you go find an individual to be a planning commissioner. We're going to take all applications still, then out of that pool, those three, whoever the council, those three are, will pick your top three individually out of those 10. I mean, I could, that's something I can live with because that's citywide applicants, so. And unfortunately, I know there's people out there, you know, you, the whole city, uh, not every district has people who want to be part of stuff. So sometimes you have districts, they just don't have any people interested. So that whole district thing is hard. I mean, I know some of you out there probably think, yeah, you council members are some of them too. So I get it. But that's only an input I got. Well, I was on the planning commission for six years. I see, I've been here a long time, so I've seen it different ways and it's been done this way for the last 20 and we've had more applicants now. For sometimes we've had um, two openings, we've had two applicants, we've had three openings, we have three applicants. Um, I just think maybe, I, I like the way we're doing it now. I, I want to recommend no change. Well, I can, I can see what, what um, they're saying about all 10 of those that are here right now. Each one of you could interview each one of them or pick from that, from that uh, group. 
um, that would be fine with me, but uh, districting, definitely not. I just wanted to see if you were there, but districting, we have a hard time, like Danny said, getting people to come in for the Planning Commission, except this time we have a lot. So um, I could see that, doing it that way, but we have to have, remember, next time when we have three of them open, we got to have three people here to be put on the planning commission so There's what you're saying then but yeah if you have 10 people the three of us interview them then you, you talk about it being cumbersome now that's even gonna be more cumbersome because that means we have to each one of us would have to interview all 10 people individually not as, as a two-person committee in, and 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 breaking it down to a right. to a one two three or four um because uh, you know the, the first time i got put on i was actually the number six candidate and then what a person you know because we were 10 or 12 people applied the the, the people um, got appointed and I was the six because they redid the whole uh, planning commission at the time all five were were done and then I was number six so when the person resigned they just said well you were number six so we're gonna pick you because we already went through the venting I was vented by two councilmen at the time that that's the way they also did the venting and then it went to the council so I just, you know, it's, you know, you're talking, like I say, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know, it would take a day, half a day to do that, I realize, and I don't have a problem with that, but you're, if you're looking at streamlining it or making it um, citywide, I feel we should keep it the same way, but. So, so to Cindy Bernard's point, um, districts one and district four have been underserved with the planning commission. We do have a lot of applicants this time. Um, and that is because of uh, community activists from District 1 and District 4 going out in the streets and, and looking for applicants. Um, and so we have a, we think that this method that we're moving, that, that we're suggesting is actually going to be able to maintain participation because then it would be up to each council member to kind of get out there into their areas and, and, and try to get people to, to, to serve. So um, I think that that's extra, and I understand the importance of getting people that are interested in serving on the planning commission, but when we get into that, like three and two and that kind of stuff, like Danny said, we may get to a point where it's three seats and we only have two applicants, you know, and then we still have to campaign and recruit and that kind of stuff. So I do agree that I think that maybe we do need to campaign a little bit more um, in the future, you know, but um, I, I like the, the two um, council members and I think it should be the mayor and the mayor pro tem. And then, um, but I do uh, think that the, the full council should be able to view all the applications to see and then, um, you know, as far as the interviews and that kind of stuff, um, um, you know, the mayor, the mayor pro tem, and then the city manager or a city employee um, sit on the interview panel and then do the interviews. So, well, that's the community what I development think. director, if you want to do it that way, the community development director, well, okay. which should be yeah. the one, the actually so we, he could um, yeah. get the feel of what the if the person really what the person wants to be on there for just for themselves for an individual um, or the whole citywide because I'm looking for citywide like like Steve said we didn't we didn't want this district thing there was right. citywide elections that's the way this city was set up that's the way people wanted it we didn't have a choice yeah we so we did not have a choice so yeah. this way we I mean this is the only thing we get to keep citywide I guess yeah, yeah I you know just to, just to touch on that a little bit, um, I, 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 in my heart, I truly believe that districts matter. I wouldn't be here. Um, I think if it wasn't for districts, I think that districts are the key to equity. Um, districts are not for population. I understand the city is has a low population, but we are 58 square miles. We geographically, we're big. And some areas of the city don't get the service that they need. Well, so back to planning commission, I think that's the way we need to go is that um, the full council look at all the applications and then um, 
but the interviews be um, Keith, uh, Steve, and me. Then, then, then as we've done in the past, that committee then recommends to the full council? Yeah. So? Okay. That's, that's my thought. That's what I think. That's what I'm recommending. That's right. I'm, a, I'm right there. So, so, so it's a future agenda item. It's a future agenda item to request. So if there's not three members who want to change it, ultimately it just dies and we'll do it the way we've always done it, um, which is that way as described. So, yeah. Assuming that's where we're at. The only thing I have different is when he said the mayor, mayor pro tip. When I first got on, it was one of my first things I got to be part of because I was learning. So that was my first, as a young, brand new council member, I got put on that to yeah, learn yeah. some of the stuff with uh, John Cole, who yeah. was the mayor or Mayor Pro Tem at the time. So he was older, know what he was looking at, and he was teaching me these are the things we're looking for. So I got to learn some stuff while sitting in that seat. So if we do do this, I believe our new council members should be, that's one of those first ones. You start learning how to be at meetings and got to go places and interviews and stuff for future, you know, bigger stuff that you'll be part of. So I think that's a learning point for him. And um, I can do it again and with him so we can do it together or yourself and him. Just my recommendation to get to that first step of that interview process. Yeah, and that will be the next item as far as yeah. appointments. If, I yeah. you, but for later. Okay. I well, I'd recommend it. leaving it the way it is then and then um, maybe after we decide or you bring it back, we can put Octavius on with Mac. So well, I can do it right now. Huh? That's the next item. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so uh, so it's a future agenda item. So there's, so the question then is, there's, is there three that want to change it? Because if not, then it just dies. No. No. So, okay. So then it doesn't change. So the uh, future agenda item died then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Number 14, City Council Regional Organization Assignments. And. I don't have a list. Well, I didn't pull the package. well before, I'm going to change it. And I'm going to put, for the Planning Commission subcommittee, I'm going to put you on it with Steve. <coughs> Steve and Octavius. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, you know, just for transparency so the public knows, if you, uh, oh, if you yes. want maybe the city clerk to read it or if you want to read uh, No, yeah, she can read it. I just wanted to make that change. Okay. Who is appointed for what? Please. I know. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Right. I guess I'm supposed to give y'all this time. Yeah. Oh, okay. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Okay. So for San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, SBCTA, we have the council representative as Joel Klink and Daniel Mintz. Can y'all please take it outside? Thank you. For the SBCTA Measure I Committee, we have Joel Klink as a representative and Daniel Mintz as alternate. Desert Mountain Division League, uh, Desert Mountain Division of the League of California Cities Council Representative Octavia Scott and alternate MacArthur Wright. MBTA or Basin Transit Council Representative Daniel Mintz, Council Representative MacArthur Wright, and alternate Octavia Scott. San Bernardino County Solid Waste Task Force, Council Representative MacArthur Wright, Alternate Stephen Bildrain, Mojave Desert Air Quality Management District, also known as MDAQMD, Council Representative Daniel Mintz, Alternate Stephen Bildrain. As subcommittees, we have for Economic Development Subcommittee, Daniel Mintz and MacArthur Wright. Personnel Subcommittee, MacArthur Wright and Stephen Bildrain. Community Block Grant, CDBG, Daniel Mintz, Senior, Stephen Bildrain. Wastewater Subcommittee, Daniel Mintz and MacArthur Wright. Legislative Committee, Stephen Bildrain, Octavia Scott. Budget and Audit, Joel Klink, Stephen Bildrain. And Planning Commission Subcommittee, Octavia Scott and Stephen Bildrain. Is everyone in approval of these appointments that Mayor Wright has made? Aye. Everybody good? Consensus? Anybody want to change? No? All right. Good to go. Committee stand as is. Thank you. Thanks, honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I was trying to get well. No. Okay. Um, any future initiated uh, council initiated items? All right. Public comments. This is the time for the public to address the city council on issues within the jurisdiction of the city council that are not on this agenda. All comments are to be directed to the city council and shall not consist of any personal attacks. Members of the public are expected to maintain a professional, courteous decorum during their comments. There is a time limitation of three minutes per person. If you haven't already done so, please fill out name and address slips and give them to the city clerk. The city council is prohibited by state law from taking action or discussing items not included on the printed agenda. Public comments on specific agenda items will be deferred until consideration of the item on the agenda. Okay, I got... Uh, did Alex Garcia stay? Nope. Uh, Bo Campbell. He left too. All right. Mr. Khrushchev. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, I guess I would like to comment on a concern that I have as a citizen about sometimes how decisions are made. And I think I'm going to use as an example the VHR uh, regulation. I know that when we formed the committee, well, I hate to get back to this, but we worked many meetings, and two of you know how long we worked on that. And we made recommendations to the council, and one of the recommendations which I think would have alleviated something here was the number of licenses per entity, because we recommended two. And I was at that meeting when we had a full forum and an individual stood up and said, but I have five licenses. And our council said, okay, then let's make it five. I get concerned when we make policy decisions based upon who shows up in the gallery. And I know that our staff does a great work on putting the staff reports together and there's a lot of things. So I think that we really need to do, uh, do that. And I would agree with uh, council member Scott, we need to get out to our Districts. We need to walk through, talk to our people, go to the meetings. I think that's a better way to do it than depending on how the gallery is going to say. And that's all I wanted to say on that. I think you're all doing a great job. I think our staff is doing a fantastic job. So thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Vino. Thank you. I've got some Okay, clock already started. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to I want to welcome our this newest council member Scott uh, to this to the city. You grabbed my heart after I saw an article on social media meeting with Beth, whose house the city was trying to expropriate. You publicly promised that if you become city council member never to displace somebody from their home. That's when you want my support. Housing, roof over somebody's head, is close and dear to my heart. Your posting really jogged my memory. I grew up under the apartheid South African government, and they displaced a lot of families under the Group Areas Act. To me, the Group Areas Act and the eminent domain. There's no difference. Both are used to displace families, similar to what the city staff was actually proposing to the council. Thank you, Councilman Joel Kling, for taking some action. Thanks. As a kid, my dad told us stories of families that were torn and destroyed. Some of them went through depression when they were displaced. The bus terminal can always be moved 
and the propose at the proposed Hilton site. I never knew that the proposed Hilton site was uh, on an ENA. And but in but in our city, housing is not important for our community, but bed tax is. When you are an elected to serve the community, it's a high honor and you have a deep rooted duty. There is a huge shortage of affordable housing in our city. This is starting to cause a social problem and you heard one of the gentlemen talk, this, talk earlier, I think he had tears in his eyes. The site you see in my handout, I walk it quite often. I personally counted over 20 homeless people staying in those bushes. Let's try to do something for the, for the poor that can afford the houses. Thank you. Thank you. Point and count it's coming up. You can help them out. Okay. All right. No more green slips. City manager update. I was, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to skip it. And I'll be brief, as they say every meeting. Um, so speaking of housing, um, mm -hmm. January 21st, uh, the Morongo Basin Conservation Association between 10 and 2 o'clock um, has invited uh, Curtis Yakima, the town manager of uh, Yucca Valley, and myself to be a, on a panel that uh, will be discussing housing um, in the Morongo Basin. They will also have, I think uh, Don Rao will be representing the uh, uh, the county uh, in the discussion, and then the uh, city managers of both town and and uh, the city will be discussing it as well. So anyway, that's January 21st, 10, 10 to 2 o'clock. Um, got some good news actually before this meeting, um, probably at 5.30, and I wanted to confirm it before I could say it. Uh, as the council knows, through several years, uh, Hat Sullivan has been one of your priorities, right? But we can never quite figure out how to fund it. Um, and we're talking, um, um, the whole uh, length from 62 clear through Adobe Road. I'm pleased to report tonight we were unsuccessful on our initial ATP, Active Transportation Project uh, application. Uh, there was additional funding and uh, 10 cities including ourselves were awarded the additional uh, funding for that. So uh, Hatch Sullivan um, just got awarded that. Uh, so we'll be starting the planning. I know it'll be very uh, good news to the council and the constituents that have talked about it for many years. Um, strategic planning uh, is coming up uh, the 24th of January, the 25th of January, Tuesday, Wednesday, 3 to 8, so 10 hours worth of planning. Um, you know, with that, obviously, we will be canceling the, you know, 24th meeting uh, because in, in lieu of that, we will be having our strategic planning. But in looking at the calendar, just wanted to throw out the council. So the next regularly scheduled meeting happens to be February 14th, you know, maybe an important day for maybe some, I don't know, Valentine's Day. <laughs> so I just wanted to throw that out. Uh, didn't know if the council wanted to do anything, uh, change uh cancel that meeting, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out to let you know that, um, you know, you can kind of think about it, talk, tell, talk to me offline, pending any, you know, urgent items coming up before the council. Uh, then finally, um, it's this Thursday between 5 and 7 at Patriotic Hall, our social equity, uh, uh, another, another hearing uh, will be done at Patriotic Hall uh, this Thursday at, between 5 and 7 o'clock. So uh, that's all my updates, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, tonight we're going to adjourn the first meeting of 2023 in memory of Planning Commissioner Mr. Greg Mendoza. No, no, you may be right, actually. Just me by myself. <laughs> <laughs>